science talk of the month. Today's speakers are Jacob Nafarski and Dr. Chris Zaleski, both from the Loughborough University. Jacob has completed his BSc in Chemical Engineering at the Loughborough University, being the top student in his year. He is currently pursuing a PhD at Loughborough University focused on quartz crystal microbalance for soft matter sensing. Dr. Chris Zaleski completed an MSc in Biotechnology in Poland followed by an MSc and PhD in chemistry obtained at the University of Leicester. In 2020, he joined the research group led by Dr. Saurav Ghosh from Loughborough University. He has broad research interests ranging from material science to charge storage devices. So today we have been utterly honored by their presence and would love to know about how to make efficient batteries. So let's go and take the fun ride. Thank you. Okay, thank you for this very kind introduction. We are delighted to present our work. Uh, I'm Jakub. This is Chris. Okay. Uh, greetings to all our listeners. And uh, let's begin. So our work is sort of divided in two parts. One is the electromechanical resonators. The other is battery electrolytes. So the way we organize this presentation is we're going to go through the basics of resonators first. Uh, I will do this part, and then I will give it over to Chris to present the battery, uh, battery side of things. And in the end, we'll combine it and show you what interesting things we can do when we put the two together. So let's begin. So the story actually begins with vibration. And vibration is ever. It's one of the most common phenomena in the universe. It's used both in nature. Your heart vibrates, uh, the waves, their vibrations. Um, and it's widely, it's widely used for all sorts of engineering applications as well, for watches, for musical instruments, even your electric toothbrush. Vibrates. So uh, what's, what's important for us is we want to measure those vibrations. And the way we do it is we interface piezoelectric elements with electricity to read frequency. And how do we do that? I'll show you how we do it. Um, it starts with um, quartz crystal resonators. Um, they are thin disks, as you see, between 30 to 30 to 300 microns. So it's more or less the scale of human hair. Uh, they are made of crystalline quartz and covered by gold electrodes on, on, both, uh, on both sides. So that's nice, they look pretty, but what can we do with them? And the key is piezoelectricity. So when you apply voltage to those gold electrons, electrodes, something interesting happens. The, the top side of the crystal wants to move away from the bottom side of the crystal. In other words, the crystal shears. When, um, when we apply alternating vo voltage though, you can imagine that it will shear back and forth, back and forth. So I've made a little animation here to illustrate that. So you can imagine that this line is this line in this crystal. So we apply voltage, and this is what happens to the to the quartz. Um, by the way, you'll, you'll see later that it actually moves much quicker than that. Um, the key thing here to remember, which will come in useful, is that the electric current drawn by the electrodes increases when the oscillation amplitude of the quartz increases as well. Uh, and the way we connect it to, to those electrodes is we, we use a PCB board setup. Uh, we connect cables, and the, the crystal electrode wraps around. So one, one of the electrodes is connected here, the other electrode is connected here. So don't be scared. This is just a little bit of um, mathematical background um, to sort of explain uh, where we get the values from. And uh, the basic way to model the, the quartz crystal 
is is a spring mass dumper system for the so for the mechanical engineers out there i'm sure you will be familiar with this picture um the the spring the, st the stiffness models the elasticity of the quartz the c this is the dumping models the friction so this is both external and internal friction uh, and uh, uh, just simply applying newton's um Newton's second law. Um, I'm trying to. Yes, uh, we get uh, we get this equation. And in vibration mechanics, what we like to do is, uh, is 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 use those constants omega, which is the natural frequency, and gamma, which is the width of resonance, as I'll show you later. So using those constants, plugging into this equation, we get this, which is a second order linear differential equation. And the solution to this is a simple harmonic motion like this, um, just a sine wave, uh, with an amplitude A. And the omega, the frequency of the sine wave, you see, it's exactly the same as the frequency of the force. So, so the force wants to force itself on the mass, and the mass has to move with the same frequency of the force with some sort of amplitude. And um, this amplitude, as you see here, it, it depends on the, so omega zero, this is the natural frequency of the system, it doesn't change, and omega of the force, we can sweep it. So, it, so as you see, if the frequency of the force is close to the natural frequency of the system, the amplitude, the amplitude increases, that's resonance. So, so, so this is the phenomenon that you might be familiar with uh, vibrating bridges and uh, that sort of things. Um, and another thing that influences the amplitude, as you see, is the gamma. So that's related to friction. And you can see it on this graph with um, here are presented in terms of the quality factor. So you, you can see that when the gamma is big, the quality factor is small. So with big gamma, small quality factor, the, the peak is very small. With uh, small gamma, big quality factor, the peak is very high. So that's, that's quite intuitive. That the, more we, the more friction we apply, the, the less amplitude it's going to be. But OK, so, so, so this is just the physical background. So, but, but now let's see how, because we want to measure it. And let, let's just look at the numbers here. So, so the this, the typical uh, natural frequencies of quartz crystals that, that we use for QCM, so that's quartz crystal microbalance, is around five to fifty megahertz. So, so that's that's you know 50, 50 million cycles per second, fifty million cycles per second. So, so maybe you remember in physics class when you were um, measuring measuring the the natural frequencies of pendulums. All you have to do is sort of count the cycles and, and divide it by the time and you know the natural frequency, but how do you count 50 million cycles per second? And uh, also, it's, it's impossible to measure this uh, mass stiffness and dumping directly when we use quartz crystal for, for measurements. And instead of, instead of doing that, we can, use, uh, uh, we can use a technique of applying an equivalent electrical circuit. So remember what, what I showed you a few slides ago that when we um, when we when we oscillate this crystal with alternating current, as the oscillations of the crystal increase, the current drawn by the electrodes also increase. So so the the current will be proportional to the displacement of the quartz, and uh, this is just the ele equivalent electronic circuit. We have the we have the resistance, the capacitance, the the inductance, and these are these are um, these are you can compare them to stiffness, to to damping, and to mass. And if you look at the equation for this, it's the same form as as we've seen the mechanical equation earlier. You can see that the when the when the frequency of the current is close to the natural frequency of the system, we also have this resonance peak. And uh, the constants have their equivalences. So, so the resonant frequency here is one over square root of LC, 
the gamma is r over l. So when we so so this is the actual reading from one of our instruments. So we we apply the we apply the alternating voltage close to the resonance frequency of our crystal, which is around 14.3 megahertz. And you see that the current is maximum at a certain frequency. And uh, what we do is we can fit this current numerically. And numerically, we can simply extract the RLC values corresponding to this curve. And when we have the RLC values, we simply calculate the natural frequency and the gamma. So just to summarize those uh, last three or four slides, if you are a bit lost, that's all you need to know for the rest, for the next part. And also um, an important thing to note, this gamma, which is this R over L, corresponds to the width of the resonance peak at half of the power. And in, in vibration mechanics, or in QCM at least, what we prefer to use is gamma, the big gamma, dissipation. And this is just the small gamma divided by two. We call it the half bandwidth. So you see that here in measurements later. OK, so that's, um, that's really nice. We, we've established that uh, we have those quartz crystals, which, which oscillate at really high frequencies. We can measure them. We can measure them by by interfacing them electronically, but uh, as engineers, we're always interested in how we can apply this, or more specifically, how we can apply this to solve complex problems and get simpler answers. So let's look at this. So consider. Um, Consider the position of very thin metallic layers. That's that's often used in electrochemistry and other industrial applications. So say, for some reason, we want to deposit copper on gold. And the, this copper deposition is maybe 100 nanometers uh, thick. And if, if you ever use one of those micrometers, you know it's quite difficult to measure 100 nanometers. But what we can do instead is um, this is the position on a quartz crystal, and while the deposition the deposition is happening, we can measure the frequency parameters of the quartz. So we can keep doing those frequency sweeps. We can keep fitting the fitting the uh, the vibration properties and see how the natural frequency and dissipation is changing. So the natural frequency, if you remember for this one, from this one, depends on mass. So with increasing mass, the frequency is expected to go down. Um, so this this is a curve of, of time passing here. With the thickness of the position increasing, we can see the frequency is going down, 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 down. On the other hand, the dissipation is increasing. So we can see increasing friction. And that is because the copper, essentially, this deposition is less slippery than gold, so it will cause more friction on the quartz, and we can sense it here. Then, and we can actually, when we when we measure those frequency shifts, we can directly use it to calculate the uh, the mass of the of the copper deposition using what's called the, the Sauerbrie equation. Uh, we just need to know the properties of the quartz and the frequency shift. Uh, and then, obviously, if we have the mass, we can just divide it by by the area of the, the position, uh, and we can get the thickness. And we can get the thickness. So that's so that's one basic, simple application of the quartz crystal microbalance. And similarly, we can use it for more um, interesting things. We can uh, we can use it for sensing. We can use it as a biosensor, essentially. We can use it for sensing small molecules. So now to to, to sense um, whether a, uh, a molecule that we're interested in is, of it, is uh, present in a given sample, we can uh, functionalize the crystal in a way that we can make only the molecules that we're interested in combine to them. So the, this example shows streptavidin, which is a protein. Um, 
we then construct a little uh, microfluidic setup so that we, we flow liquid uh, over the quartz crystal, which is functionalized with uh, whatever it needs to be. And as we flow the sample, we monitor what happens to the to the frequency parameters. So here, as you see, this is the baseline. This is actually from one of the papers that our group uh, our group has published. This is the baseline, and as we flow streptavidin, we see the frequency shift going down. So the mass binds, the resonance frequency decreases. This is the curve of dissipation, but it's not so important for this application. So, so that's so that's one uh, one application sense. Uh, and uh, also in, in our group, we have used it for bacteria detection. Um, it, it can be used for biomarker detection. There's a lot of a lot of possibilities. And uh, this, uh, I'll just show you an industrial application as well. This is by a company called Violin Scientific. And they have this interesting um, interesting idea of, of uh, evaluating cleaning methods, evaluating different de detergents using quartz crystals as well. So switch my screen here. Um, just to confirm, can you see the video? Yeah, the video is visible. Okay. So I'll just show you a little part of it so you can get an idea of different applications. Um, so here they um, they have different quartz crystals that they cover different surfaces, for example, glass, stainless steel, and then, then different potential plastics, uh, soils, and and then they have this nice setup here. And uh, what they do is they, they will now apply different uh, detergents, washing programs, and they will monitor with the, with the QCM how effective are those washing programs. So as you see here, they, they're adding detergent red dots and uh, the detergent removes the soil and we can see in the background the graph of uh, of what's happening of what's being measured by the QCM the thickness of the soil decreases so we know that the cleaning is is successful and and by, by then looking at those curves we can evaluating we can evaluate different detergents different cleaning methods how quick they are how successful they are so that's uh, that's just an example of an industrial application. That's quite interesting. Um, okay. So so this was um, this was the this this was using QCM for for mass sensing. But but then when we use uh, when we use quartz crystals for any sort of applications, uh, usually they are also immersed in some sort of a liquid. So, for example, for the streptavidin example I showed you, they were um, immersed in uh, PBS, which is a binding, which is a buffer solution. Uh, so now let's look at what actually happens with the liquid when uh, when we put it on the on the quartz crystal. I have another um, animation here. So, so this is the quartz crystal. The yellow bit is the gold electrode. And see, so this is water. Um, and then this graph, it shows you the what happens with the water at uh, at the distance away from the quartz. So as you see, exactly at the quartz surface, the water sticks to the quartz and oscillates with the same amplitude. But as we go away, the amplitudes diminish until they basically go to zero at uh, at some distance. And this is because of um, of the uh, of the way the water layers shear against each other. But now, how uh, how are the vibration parameters affected by this phenomenon? And 
So, so this is uh, what you have seen in the previous animation. The, the, the velocity of the water decreases with height. And uh, this was measured by, uh, by Kanazawa. That's why at, at one Kanazawa unit, we say that uh, the amplitude of the water has increased, has decreased, uh, has decreased by e times. So that's it increased, decreased by sixty, around seventy percent. And this Kanazawa unit, it's dependent on the viscosity of the of the liquid, uh, and uh, the viscosity, the density, and also the frequency of the quartz crystal. And for Mm. For 14.3 megahertz quartz crystal with water, this distance is only 140 nanometers. So when you go farther away from the surface, the water is not affected. And uh, well, how, how the vibration parameters are affected is the resonance frequency decreases because there is some mass coupling of the water with the quartz, because uh, as you've seen on the surface, the, the water moves with the crystal. So the, the crystal sees it as additional as additional mass moving. Um, and there will also be additional dissipation, because the 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 water layers, they're shear against each other. So the, elect the, the energy is dissipated, it's lost. And the interesting thing is that the the actual, the, the half, fun, the, the gamma, the increase in the, in the dissipation, is the opposite of the decrease in frequency. So you can see how the dissipation, how the how the how the dissipation is is related to to mass coupling. And I'll I'll, I'll just show you by a simple example, using two different liquids of different viscosity. Here I use ethanol and water. Uh, this is the little setup. Um, so we we pump the the liquid for a microfluidic setup over the quartz. And uh, first, uh, we pump water, we take some scans, then we pump ethanol, take some scans, and see what happens. And uh, if you remember the uh, resonance curves, this is the current drawn by the electrode, this is the frequency, this is the drive voltage frequency. The, the blue is the frequency of the water, the, is the curve for the water. Orange is ethanol. So, because the, the viscosities are quite similar, as you see here, it's only slightly larger for water. The change is not, is not that visible, but you see that the, uh, the, the maximum, that the peak has decreased for a funnel and also moved a little bit to the left. So that's shown here, the resonance frequency fell from those, those first two scans are water, those second two scans are ethanol. And the frequency decreased. Gamma, on the other hand, the dissipation increased. And and, and as you seen in the previous Kanazawa equation, that the frequency shift should be opposite to the gamma shift. And if you look at the numbers here, they are almost exactly opposite. So that's a that's that that's how the that's how the liquids influence the the vibration parameters and and by the way those changes will be different this is for newtonian liquids if we if we use liquids that are non-newtonian with elastics these uh these changes will be a bit more complicated but more on that later so to summarize uh quartz crystals um they are quartz crystals are electromechanical resonators by interfacing them with electronics we can measure their vibration properties, and then using those properties, we can find out about the nature of things that we put on the crystals. So why, you might ask, is this of interest for batteries? I will now give it over to Chris. Hi. And he will. <coughs> so battery is a charge storage device, and essentially, when you charge it, electrical energy is being converted into chemical energy, and in this form, the energy is stored. And upon discharging, you again convert chemical energy into electrical energy and use it to power whatever device you want to power. Now, the, the two main types are primary batteries, which can only be used once, and secondary batteries, which can be used several times. And most of the batteries 
currently on the market are based either on lead or on lithium, which have got disadvantages. So an alternative to this could be an aluminum battery. You are very familiar with aluminum is it's everywhere around us. It's a widely used, cheap and easy to recycle metal. So what happens during the operation of the battery? Ions travel between the anode and the cathode. Yeah? But obviously, ions, apart from charge, do have some mass. So it's essential for us to measure mass. And as Jakub already explained, quartz crystal microbalance is a very efficient way of measuring mass. So an electrolyte is a reservoir of, of charge carrying species, which are always called ions. And the cations and anions, their total charge is always equal when the battery is in the, in the stable state. An electrochemical window is a potential range within the, which the electrolyte can safely operate. And if you exceed that, the battery will start to degrade. So this would happen, for example, if you overcharge your battery, it might eventually explode because you exceeded the electrochemical window. So this is a very important parameter of, of the electrolyte. So most of the batteries currently on the market have got what is called classic electrolyte. So for example, in your car, most likely you have a battery which is filled with aqueous based electrolyte, which is basically diluted sulfuric acid. Now they do have some advantages like high conductivity, but they are corrosive like sulfuric acid one. The propylene carbonate based electrolyte, which is used in lithium batteries is flammable and they're all prone to leaks. On top of that, the character for alternatives. And one alternative to that are ionic electrolytes. So they are based on what is called ionic liquid or their cheaper alternative, diputectic solvent. Now, a lot of research has been done on this. And although these have got low conductivity, they are non-flammable, less prone to leaks, and they have usually wide electrochemical window. And quite often, they are not that toxic as the, as the classic electrolytes. Now, when you want to study a battery, you need to apply some electrochemical methods. So first thing we need to know about the battery is the electrochemical potential. So for example, if you buy a battery, which is one and a half volt classic AA battery, its electrochemical potential is quantified using the NERST equation. So that's how people know what type of materials in the anode and in the cathode and in the electrolyte will give you specific potential for a battery. Now, if you look at this equation on the left briefly, you'll see that there is a value F, which is the Faraday constant, and this is charge present in one mole of elemental particles. A mole essentially is mass. So to properly study electrochemical systems, one needs to measure mass, hence the application of, of quartz to, to do that. So very often, when people want to study electrochemical systems, they use technique called cyclic voltammetry. And essentially, you can see in figure A, this is an application of a potential gradient. So you apply rising and then decreasing potential to your electrode, and you do that in cycles. And you observe changes in current. So what you apply is in the figure A, and what you see is in the figure B. You see how your current changes over the potential. And depending on what you have in your system, you get several different, what they called voltammograms. So then people combine both of these techniques, so electrochemistry and, and QCR methods, and the result was what is called EQCM, so electrochemical quartz crystal microbalance. Essentially, when, when people do cyclic voltammetry, they usually use three electrode system, where working electrode is where all the reactions take place, Counter electrode is an inert electrode, and the reference electrode provides a reference potential, which is then compared to standard potentials of, of other systems. So that essentially, reference electrodes provides you with zero point. Yeah? So you know that your, uh, when you know the zero, you can measure the potential of your battery, and then you know that this battery gives one and a half volt, or three volts, or nine volts. 
and in the technical EQCM, crystal acts as an electromechanical sensor, which allows us to measure mass and viscosity, and it's also a working electrode. So you basically do all your reactions on the crystal and measure mass and viscosity changes occurring there. And then mass and charge data, and charge is current multiplied by time, these are used to calculate what is known as transport number. So transport number essentially is proportion of anions and cations being exchanged, and it's always one. So if a cation transport number is 0 0.6, then anion is 0 0.4. And calculation of transport number is of utmost importance when optimizing the performance of any electrochemical device, not only a battery. And mass changes on the electrode are compared to Faradayic mass. Now, Faradayic mass is a mass that would be exchanged if all the electrochemical reactions taking place in your battery would be 100% efficient. So if, essentially, if your battery is efficient and you start charging it, all of the current would be used to contribute to mass changes at, at your electrode. Now, that doesn't really happen in real life, but you can see here some some electrochemical reaction where on the left you have pure electrochemistry, so essentially oxidation and reduction. And on the right you can see the associated mass changes and viscosity and, and mass changes and this mass change is compared to the Faradayic signal. So so Faradayic mass is not something that was measured. This is mass calculated purely from the current. This is under the assumption that your electrochemical reaction is hundred percent efficient. And you can see that for this particular system, almost all of the uh, electrical energy was converted into mass changes. You can see in the, all, uh, in, the, in the last cycle, the agreement is almost perfect. And pretty much entire electrical energy was used to contribute to mass changes. So what exactly happens to the crystal when you, when you do the, what is called the redox reduction oxidation cycle. You can see that this is the oxidation state and now we're going into reduction. So again, this is an oxidation and peaks are sharp because there is no load on the crystal. During the reduction cycle, metal deposits on the crystal surface, viscosity increases. So there is a very significant dumping effect, which I have already mentioned. And there is hardly any frequency reading again going back to the empty crystal yeah so you can see these are several cycles and that's how the data in the previous slide was obtained so this is an empty crystal all metal was oxidized and removed from it now metal was re reduced on the crystal so also the uh, the interesting thing with this one is that we cannot um, um, what I talked about earlier about the the, the frequency, the mass binding and the, and the dissipation increasing. Here we have we have both. We have we have mass binding and dissipation, and then we have to model it to to to, start, to determine which 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 shifts are due to dissipation and which uh, shifts are due to mass, so we can accurately uh, determine the can accurately determine the transport numbers. So that's 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 uh, part of the work which we are working on right now. So, that's the first. so also what one has to consider is something known as dendrite growth. Now this is this is actually something you guys are all probably heard at in some uh, at some point. So basically because not all of the electrical energy is used into efficient mass changes and the movement of ions, what sometimes happens, dendrites, which are like sharp metal spikes, can grow on the surface of the anode. Now, what happens then is the dendrite grows and connects anode and the cathode. Essentially, you get a shortcut, and that causes battery fire. Now, this is the reason for fires. If you sometimes hear about a laptop or a mobile phone catching fire during charging. So this is this is a problem with batteries, and as, especially now that there is increased use of electric vehicles, this is a problem that needs to be addressed. So quartz crystal microbalance can be used also to observe the growth of dendrites, and this is something we currently also work on. 
Now, what is the, the future of batteries? It's very likely that polymer gel electrolytes will be used in the future. And these are highly viscous substances where, where ionic electrolyte, like the ones I mentioned before, is mixed with a polymer. There already has been publications on this, on this work. And essentially, presence of polymer is thought to prevent dendrite formation. And this will increase the longevity of the battery. So this here is a demonstration of a casing-free polymer gel-based battery. Now, what is interesting about that battery that here the thick polymer holds the battery as a cylinder with anode and cathode being, being immersed in it. And this is only wrapped in a plastic foil to, to hold the battery together. So, so basically, battery like that should provide more energy per weight because you bypass all the need for a heavy casing, which is very common in a lithium or, or lead acid battery. Here, the polymer gel, which is an electrolyte, is, is strong enough to hold the battery in the form of a cylinder. So essentially, how we have created that battery, we coated anode and cathode in the polymer gel and then roll them in sort of cylindrical shape wrap it in the plastic tape and it stands on its own so this this theoretically could be the future of batteries which would be much li much lighter and storing much more energy than, than the currently available batteries on the market so these are our acknowledgements so the the whole work was actually inspired about the salvage project which is a project that was devoted to aluminium battery and we would like to thank Victor Ostani of Cambridge University. Any questions? So thank you for your attention and I'd like to hear questions if you have any. Uh, okay, so this was like really innovative. Like, I like the idea of how you used uh, resonators to map out the processes going on inside the batteries. So there are a few questions. One is, uh, can you please uh, elaborate more on the deep eutectic solvents and like what makes them cheaper? They use, they are based on widely available chemicals. So I put references to, to, to each slide where I was presenting some work. So, no, no, going back, going back. So, I suggest you read that reference here. This is this is basically the reference to that diputetic solvent which I have shown in this publication. And diputetic solvents were conceived, I think, in 2002 by Professor Abbott. And this, this is a paper from his group. And you can see that this particular diputetic solvent is based on urea, which is essentially a fertilizer. So, so the whole the whole point of using diputetic solvent is that they are based on widely available and affordable and usually safe materials. So they beat other electrolytes first in the term of cost, and that is quite important if you want to apply these electrolytes on a on a wide scale. Uh, so uh, I would like. Mm. About that, uh, like, how can UCR be commercially used? I mean, in batteries, you can use it to check the formation of spikes, but if batteries are commercially sold, like, will QCR be fitted inside it and the users can check it out because the users might not be conversant about the, I mean, the thing which is going on inside the battery, right? or does it have to be used by experts uh, occasionally to check well this is used in fundamental studies so you use you use the qcr to study the battery systems until you develop a system where you see that that the formation of, of dendrites does not occur or is minimized as much as possible yeah so so the so the qcr is not actually used by uh, the end users of the battery it is used by uh, by engineers and scientists uh, in the development stages of the company, of 
uh, batteries. So, so, the, so it's used for testing different uh, different electrolytes, different uh, different configurations. Um, it's used it's used as a development tool. So the so yeah so 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 that's the this application of QCR. And but but QCR also uh, if you're interested in you know general applications as as I shown earlier sometimes it's used in in industry to um. Uh, you know, to monitor, uh, to monitor cleaning, to 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 um, to test the uh, contamina contamination of of, of different um, uh, of different liquids, and also it can be used in the medical industry for for diagnosing uh, for diagnosing um, diseases. And uh, as, as you mentioned, that yeah, obviously the end users they they you know they they don't have to be conversant and. Uh, you know, and all of and all of that, but that's not really necessary to, you know, to to use the quartz crystal microbalance for detection because often we're just interested in basic shifts. So 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 we see like that the the frequency is going down, and then if we if we program it, um, if we make software, we say that with this frequency associated with this material. It, 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 it's just uh, it just equals this sort of mass decrease. So so for for actually commercial purposes, the the quartz crystal can be uh, quartz crystal resonators can be really simplified and make and made uh, made pretty intuitive. So uh, in the piezoelectric sensors, we are using gold electrodes, right? Uh, so can we like why do we use gold like can we use a cheaper variant because it might make it make it more costly i i don't know about the if it is very small so it might be cost effective but well the most commonly used crystals are coated by gold and you can have them coated by other materials uh, the thing is gold is usually quite resistant chemically and that's why we use it also it's a good conductor of electricity but you are right quite often platinum or molybdenum coated crystals are used and these are also used in electrochemistry not to, to, to study different systems we just use this because we are we are familiar with that and the whole object here was to to be able to study the electrochemistry of a battery and and especially the viscous electrolytes and the the exact processes that happen here because remember what Jakub initially showed in one of his slides with with water and methanol where essentially the, these are liquid of two different viscosities yes but their viscosity do not change now when you deal with a battery this is not the case so electrolyte starts with one viscosity and then its viscosity changes during the process yes so so they, they have variable viscosity. And you know, for example, in here, you can see that not only mass, but also viscosity changes. And that's quite a lot. So QCR is a very good study, tool to study these type of, type of processes. And can uh, QCR be used in measuring the decay of organic polymers used in solar cells? like? Is it cost effective to use these sensors in organic solar cells? Well, maybe not to be built into a solar panel, but definitely this is used in fundamental studies. There is <coughs> plenty of literature on that. So it's EQCM is very, very good tool to use study any electrochemical system where essentially instead of using standard working electrode, which often can be a, a platinum wire, you just use your crystal as a mass and viscosity measuring tool and working electrode at the same time. Uh, can you explain the significance of the Kanazawa unit? And because yeah. Um, so I'll show you that's that's a very interesting uh, part of the Version theory. It's, when I learned about this, um, I was amazed at how it uh, how it works out. So I'll try to go. So so to actually get to this, there's um, 
there's there's quite a bit of derivations uh, to go through, so I didn't include it in, in this short presentation. So if you want to actually look at the details, if you just uh, search for Kanazawa, uh, for Kanazawa, Kanazawa's original paper, I think this was in 1985, you, you'll find all the derivations. But I'll try to give you maybe a basic intuition for it. So, 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 so I'll, I'll just show this again. So, so this is the basic. Uh, so this is the basic fact of what happens. This is the basic fact of what happens when you put water on a, on a resonating crystal. So it, it doesn't slip entirely at the edge. It doesn't slip. It moves exactly at the same speed of the crystal. But then, because water, you can see it as sort of layers, layers which uh, which shear against each other, and um, and from layer to layer. Uh, a bit of this uh, of this velocity is lost. It's dissipated, and it's it's dissipated uh, in friction, for the internal friction of water. And and this the the higher the uh, the the higher the viscosity of the water, the sooner this this motion will be dissipated. So with so now coming to Kanazawa. You see this Kanazawa unit. It depends on the it depends on the viscosity viscosity of the water. So so with um, with large viscosities, the this um, this Kanazawa unit. Uh, sorry, I may have confused you a bit before, but with large viscosity, this Kanazawa unit actually increases so so let's imagine say something is very uh very small viscosity like uh like close to a gas right like air like if you if you move if you move air uh at, at, at a at a surface this uh this this motion is not really this motion is not uh transmitted very far but if you if you move something like uh more um uh, more viscous, then there's not enough. Um, then, then this dissipation will go, will go further. And 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 also, what is intuitive, you, you see, it, it it's dependent on the frequency, frequency of oscillation. So, if you imagine the, if the crystal moves very quickly, the the water doesn't really have time. To, to follow this crystal if it moves slowly it, you can say if, if it if it would be just be moving a plate very very slowly a lot of the water would be moving with the plate but if we change the direction back and forth all the time then it, it has moved a little bit but then it cannot it cannot it cannot go back so with increasing frequency this uh, this kind of unit decreases and and it just tells us it it, it, it just tells us um, how um, how quickly this this motion will dissipate. So with uh, with larger Kanazawa units, uh, this this motion dissipates uh, farther away from the surface. With smaller Kanazawa units, uh, the motion dissipates closer to the surface. And this is significant, um, especially if if we're using particle detection, because uh, we have to know the we have to look at the relative size of the particles. So so say if we have a bacteria here for example in the quartz surface and bacteria is, is more or less uh, one micron one micron big so that's 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 almost that's around eight times the kanazawa unit so so only a part of this bacteria if we put it in, in water will be uh, will be um, will be influenced by the moving by the motion of the water and the majority of the bacteria will be stationary so that, that's just things we have to consider. We, we look at the Kanazawa unit, how how the how far is water the water is moving, and then um, depending on um, what we're trying to sense, we have to see what the what the physics will be. So I, I hope this sort of answers your question. Yeah, that's a really great ex uh, explanation. Okay, so I will just ask a small mathematical question. In that formula for 
uh, finding the mass from natural frequency. I mean, omega equals to root over k by m, right? So, so yeah, yeah, this one, yeah, yeah. So you are using this to find out the mass, and uh, so I mean to say that if there are more than one layer of material, they will have different stiffness, right? So you have. Do you need to account them in the formula? Like gold will have a different stiffness than quartz, say, or copper. So will it lead to any like error? I don't know. Like, do we need to account for that? Yes, they they will have um, they will have different stiffnesses, and uh, we we cannot really. Um, it's it's very difficult to do an actual mathematical model for uh, for every situation that we encounter. So, so I mean, the idea of this is, is we do a model which uh, sort of sums up all those stiffnesses, all those dissipations, and uh, sort of averages them out. So, so, so this is the, the stiffness. I mean, because the majority of the of, of, of this influence will be the will be the the quartz itself. The, the stiffness of the quartz itself, but then depending on what what we put on the quartz, this uh, the the motion will be will be slightly changed, and uh, we then assume as the change of this motion uh, is 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 modeled by by this uh, generic uh, generic expression, and and that's that's pretty much that's the simplest one we can use for. Um, for this sort of resonate resonators, that's a that's a linear model. Sometimes we can try if if, if we say because that's all linear. If we, if we think that the nonlinear effects are uh, are significant, then we can try to make more complicated models. But for for you know for our applications, um, this this tends to be enough. And and also often in I mean in in quartz crystal microbalance, we're we're not interested in absolute values we're uh, we're more interested in changes so yeah so so just here like uh, just a simple a simple mass uh, detection we so so this is a, a frequency offset from some values and we don't need to know the we don't need to know the absolute um, frequency we just have to know what what will be the change what will be the change of the frequency um, we're binding, but also if you want to know more about uh, why we can use this, because I showed you this uh, Sauerbri equation that 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 you see that the mass is only proportional to frequencies, and it, it involves some approximations. As you said, we cannot we cannot because things have different things have different uh, things have different stiffnesses and so on, but. Uh, this approximation it, it tends to be very accurate for for rigid binding and for small uh, for small uh, for small thicknesses so if, if you want to see the exact uh, you know derivation and, and assumptions in that you can also search for Sauerbri's original publication and then you can go more. Yeah. yeah yeah I think that's all the questions we have right now so I will ask Campus Radio to take. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sajid, for handling all the questions. And uh, we have a few general questions, which uh, which is on the mind of everyone. The first question is, what uh, you know, like, what was your motivation to uh, you know work on this area, or what uh, in a way made you interested in this uh, this specific problem? If you could uh, tell us about that a bit. So I previously worked on battery development program, which is which is described in the acknowledgement slide, and and that that prompted me to to work on the, the fundamental study of how exactly the mass and viscosity changes during the the redox cycle, which can be imagined as a charge discharge cycle of a battery, and you need to know this if you want to. To understand what's going on in the inside of the battery, 
to construct a better prototype and then and then hopefully that goes into the mass production so because there is now a lot of drive towards electric vehicles and a lot of the personal devices now that we use i use I use batteries and there is there's increasing demand on lithium or other alternatives need to be found need to be found and aluminium is one of them so this can be applied to many other systems it's just that uh, batteries are now hot topic because of the demand so <laughs> Yeah, so, so for myself, uh, you asked what uh, sort of got me into this, this work. Um, w when I was um, starting my, my PhD, I was um, mostly focused on um, medical applications of those sensors. I, I wanted to um, use them for, for biosensing, I, 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 because I see myself maybe working in the future as uh, in, in the medical uh, technology industry, but uh, with the with the fundamentals and, and 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 still that's actually my main line of work. Um, but with the fundamentals uh, of of vibrations um, that that I have learned, uh, I can now apply it to to different uh, to, to different things. And for example, uh, this. Uh, this um, this battery electrolyte work is one of them. So I've met Chris, and Chris was really interested in batteries, and he sort of got got me involved in this uh, in this whole project, and that's how that's how it started for me. Good. Uh, thanks a lot for sharing that. And um, uh, the last question of the session would be: uh, What advice would you like to give as established scientist yourself? What advice would you give to undergraduate students who are interested in pursuing research? Be open-minded. So, so you can always use people from, you know, use knowledge of people from completely different backgrounds and apply something that was uh, something that was actually devised to study biological systems, and it can be used to study batteries. So, so you know, the the the, the essential mass and viscosity changes, as Jakub has shown. Uh, they can be occurring in biological system, it can be some very simple copper deposition process, or it can be something that goes on inside of the battery. So if you want to know more, I suggest you read the references that I put into the presentation, and you'll know, you you, you you'll find out basically what, 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 what you know, why, why we're doing this. But if, if, if this type of batteries are to be the future, to construct better prototype a lot of fundamental studies have to be carried out and that's what that's what we were doing essentially the the, the, the fundamental study of you know, what exactly goes on yeah so that, that was our main motivation so yeah I asked for um, advice for people starting with um, with science, I haven't honestly. I haven't really thought about um, this for too long yet because uh, up till now I was the one usually asking for um, for advice. But um, yeah, w w one thing I would say maybe if you're um, when you're when you're beginning with um, with uh, scientific work not not only not only uh, not only PhD projects but also also undergraduate projects um, it's uh, it's really helpful to, to sort of focus on the on the fundamentals on, on scientific fundamentals like really going deeply into and in, into physics and mathematics of things and uh, and and just go really slowly with that. Just go really slowly and until you really have an intuitive understanding of of concepts. And um, what 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 this does is it is it gives you really great power to to then um, to then apply your really fundamental knowledge to 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 a variety of different concepts, which which uh, on the you know and on on the outset may seem to be. May seem to be unrelated. So, so, so I would say that 
that's that's a really good uh, that's a really good mindset to have. That once you learn something, you know, keep asking your que yourself questions, try to go deeper, try to maybe explain it to someone else, because I think as someone said, if you cannot explain something to another person simply, it means doesn't it means you don't really understand it yourself. So exactly. yeah, I think uh, this attitude might be helpful. Thank you so much for the invaluable insight, and I'm uh, I'm pretty sure that all the students will appreciate it here. And uh, we'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. Jacob and Dr. Chris, for taking the time of embassy schedules and being present here. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Shritama for uh, introducing and Tanishta for helping us finding uh, these wonderful speakers.